Imagine having tea substitutes, and not just having them there as commodities to look at, but choosing this as a line of business. So the entrepreneur we're hosting this week is doing exactly that. Quite a riveting journey and story. Take a look. How we started, uh, I started it in my kitchen, where I was looking for an alternative to tea leaves. And uh, everything else on the market was either too expensive or not good. So I decided to start making my own blend from the herbs that I was growing in my, back right, my backyard. The, the mints, the special, the spear mints. So I started to, to, to dry them on my kitchen counter and make a blend that I would put in my tea instead of the normal tea leaves. Moving fast forward, when COVID happened, um, I realized there was a need for lemons and limes and oranges because they were becoming very expensive. So that's when I got the idea, what if I dehydrate these lemons, I dehydrate these limes and oranges, and then I can have them in and out of season, and I can just add them in my, in my tea without necessarily have, having to get the, the lemons and cut it and squeeze the juice out of it. What if I just have a powder that I can just add in my blend and have a lemon tea? So that is how I start now to incorporate the fruits into the, the, the blends. And how I get to the market, I made my first blend. I go with it to the workplace, by then I was still working. And my colleagues wanted to, to test, so they became my first customers. We, we source our raw materials mainly from farmers. Um, it's the, the, the ginger, the turmeric, the oranges, the lemons. These we buy from farmers. We try as much as possible to buy from the farmers directly. And we buy them in season. And we, we dry them in our solar dryer. And we incorporate them. Then when it comes to the herbs, we have a farm in Matuga where we are growing these herbs, the thyme, the mints. And then also we work with a collector who collects these herbs from small scale farmers who are also part of our community that we buy from and we, we incorporate them in our blends. Um, we also noticed that uh, most of the times people are importing mainly, of the, mainly these herbal teas from China, but they take the ingredients from here. So for us, we are trying to do, bring in a product that is going to substitute importing. And our product is made in Uganda, and we've had our clients ask whether it's made in Uganda. So one of our main challenge has been that we are competing with imported goods, and that, that are at a lower, that especially the Chinese teas are usually at a lower price. And, and then the other imported teas, have made a brand that for us we are competing against big brands, but still we are beating this competition by consistently bringing a quality product. The other challenge has been the seasons. Sometimes we struggle with the seasonal crops, and if we don't get enough of them during the season, uh, they get very expensive when they're out of season, and that really affects uh, our, our production costs. But we have also had inconsistency with farmers that you get them on board and they start to get greedy. They think you're going to export, they think they're going to make, so they decide to hoard these raw materials. And, uh, and at the end of the day, others have been trying to dry it themselves and it's of a lower quality because first we want to take care of the entire value chain from the entire processing. That's how we can ensure the quality. Yeah. So we've had farmers wanting to do it themselves. So one of the things we want to do moving forward is to also get farmers and train them and also be able to avail them with portable solar dryers that instead of drying the things on the ground, they can dry them themselves and then they can sell to us. Um, from, this, uh, from this business, we have been able to draw back uh, most of our revenues to grow the business. Like I told you, we started in the kitchen. We were using a, a small dehydrator and then we upgraded to a, a solar dryer. But when we were also able to win some funding through the NSSF High Innovator, 
that we use to set up our farm in Matuga. We currently now have a five ton solar dryer. We have a greenhouse where we are growing these herbs and an open field where we are also growing the herbs. In our Make Money segment this week, we share with you tips on how you can actually make it in the space of selling pasture. Uh, we decided to venture into uh, pasture growing and pasture selling because there is money in, in selling and establishing pastures. Uh, as you can see, we do sell pasture seeds and seedlings. Uh, besides selling seeds and seedlings, you can still grow pastures and you add value on pastures. That is by making hay and silage out of pastures and you start selling specifically hay or silage to those farmers who have got smaller pieces of land and they have nowhere to plant their pastures and so they can own animals, then they buy pastures in form of hay and silage specifically. Those are ready feeds for feeding the animals. Uh, you can make money out of growing pastures in different ways. Uh, as you have seen, we are selling pasture seeds. And you too, you can sell pasture seeds through multiplication. As you have seen, we have some that we sell as seedlings, others we sell cuttings, and others we make seeds, that we multiply seeds and we sell them to farmers. Uh, another way you can make money out of pastures is by, by adding value on pastures. You find you, yourself selling like hay, like silage, as you have seen. I will give you a picture in terms of acreages. For example, we have seen like Chloris Guyana and Bracaria Mulatto. If you establish an acre of Chloris Guyana and Bracaria Mulatto, you're likely to get like 200 bales per harvest. They be selling a bale of hay at 10,000. That is averagely a bale of around 14, 15 kilograms. And remember, we harvest these pastures three times in a year. So after you have established, for you, yours is just to be managing them very well. After harvesting, you make your bales of hay, you begin selling, you wait for like two and a half months or three, depending on the fertility of your soil. You keep on harvesting, you make your bales of hay, and you sell. If you plant your pastures, as you have seen, Ali Alona he told you that uh, these animals, they need to have balanced diet, like human beings we do. They need carbohydrates, and so we have pastures that provide carbohydrates. We have pastures that are energy giving. We have pastures that are protein supplements. So once you give your animals a balanced diet, as you have seen rich in all those nutrients, first of all, they are people who are doing fattening. Uh, fattening, you will be able to fatten strictly those who fatten cows. They will be fattening within three months. You find your animals have added some weight and you sell them off, you restock and you'll be making money. Of course, even the animals themselves, when they get a balanced meal, they will add on their milk. As you've heard, someone who is interested in dairy farming, they're supposed to concentrate so much in protein supplements. The likes of alfalfa, queen of forages, caliandra, centrosima, all legumes and forage trees. Those ones, they provide proteins and you'll be able to get more milk. And also when you plant those pastures, you will be able to even get income through selling some pastures like hay and silage. Now with climate change, we can no longer rely on just purely nature's providence to do agriculture. Of course, in here, irrigation comes into the picture. And in our segment, the tech segment today, we're sharing with you new smart technologies in irrigation. We realize that you, in Uganda we, and all, all over Africa anyway, we have farmers who are not available on the farm. And they want to know whether their crops have been irrigated. So that's why we had partnerships with the largest manufacturer 
uh, where you can turn on your irrigation from the comfort of your office. I mean, you're in Kampala, but you're able to turn on a system in Kabale, you know, in Kapchorwa, in Kapirebyong, uh, to irrigate your crops. How this is done is that we have a controller that we program and is able uh, to turn on the irrigation uh, when it's the right time. And when it rains, it will suspend the irrigation. But still, you also have the monotony of saying, let me stop my irrigation. Now, we have been known to be in only irrigating crops like coffee, like uh, perennial crops, uh, vegetables. But now we are saying, even at your home, you can irrigate your lawn. You know, we've seen lawn drying in hotels, uh, in homes of people. And this is where also the irrigation is key. Our, our, our other service line is boreholes. We are able to extract water from the boreholes using the power of the sun. And we are going green. We, we are advocating for the use of green and renewable energy. All the machines we have at SpringTech are powered by solar. We had uh, several challenges, especially with our farmers because of the initial cost of the equipment. As well as we take you through the cost uh, benefit analysis, and for those who are doing crops like vegetables, they're able to get their money out. But for people who are doing low value crops like maize, where they have to plant on a large scale, they are still facing the initial cost of investment. And how we address that is we brought, we brought in development partners to help us subsidize the irrigation, but also we work with banks where you're able to get a soft loan and you could irrigate your crops and when you get the yields, then you're able to, to pay back. Major it has been on the initial setup, but now our kits are becoming more and more and more affordable. And, and then also we deal in high quality products. We, we do not go less than quality. There are so many advantages of irrigation. Ideally, when there is, when there is sun, when it is shining, you're, you're not able to, to have yields because the crops don't have the necessary water that they need. Like I said, for crops, you need to have a good fertilizer, like good soil. You need to provide with them also water. But when they don't get water, they wilt. So that third season, uh, you find when you're not irrigating, you don't have the yields. Now what happens when you irrigate? When you irrigate in the third season, you're able to have a harvest when other people don't have who have not irrigated. So that means you get more money by selling. Obviously, when you look at the science of a crop, it is proportional to the amount of water that you give it. So when you irrigate, no doubt, with all the agronomical factors are still in place, you will get uh, a bumper harvest. That's all we had for you this week in this edition of Man and Markets. Now, however we say that businesses are going concerned and we like to keep this conversation going as usual, of course, we are live on our digitals and social media channels. So drop us a line and let's have the conversation for comments, questions and suggestions. I've been your host, Charles Boyd. Now, for me and team, we wish you a very good evening.